Welcome to Face to Face, and today we're going to we're going to go to Afghanistan, and we're going to talk about the situation for the young women and the people there uh, after the the taking of power of the uh, of the Taliban after the U.S. left um, Afghanistan. So I'm with Katie Kelly. Welcome to Face to Face, Katie. Well, thank you very much, David, for having me. You're welcome. So first, let, let's introduce a little bit yourself and your organization, and then we can, we will go deeper a little bit about the present situation in uh, in Afghanistan and all the news that we get about the, the women not be able to uh, go to school and be banned of many activities, cannot go on the street by themselves, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Mm, right. Well, thank you. For many years, I was part of a group called Voices for Creative Nonviolence, and before that, we were called Voices in the Wilderness. And our idea was that um, when the United States was waging war against other people, we should try our best to end that war. And um, perhaps rather than sending soldiers into war zones, we said, what about sending unarmed people? And so we went you know, unarmed to Iraq many, many times, and we broke the economic sanctions against Iraq. We um, committed civil disobedience and bought medicines to children and families in Iraq. And um, we were also very conscious of the United States waging war against Afghanistan. And we were thinking, you know, we have to be more able to address 21st century means of waging war, which so often involved drone attacks. And so we first had started to go to visit people in Pakistan who were victims of drone attacks. And we had an invitation to go over to Afghanistan and um, we were guests of uh, an Italian hospital, a very, very fine hospital that served people from all backgrounds, didn't ask any questions. Anyone who was a victim of war would be eligible to get surgery at the um, Emergency Surgical Center for Victims of War. And while we were there, uh, this was way back in 2009, we began to learn more about a group of teenagers who, in fact, had been fasting on a mountainside in solidarity with a group of us who were protesting Guantanamo. And we said, who are these youngsters? And we had a chance to talk with them and Amy Goodman on Democracy Now! So, so, so they were what? They were fasting in the mountain? In the winter, in a tent. And, you know, I thought, well, who are these kids? I know. That's it was a, really that's very amazing. amazing. Story. Yeah. They were so idealistic, and they still are. I mean, David, their idea of radical sharing was such that when they get their hands on resources, they would immediately go up the mountainside to interview the poorest of the widows. And, oh, my God, they were poor. And they were living so high up on the mountainside because the rent came down because there was no access to water. And sometimes their food source was whatever their children could glean from scraps in the marketplace. So they would do surveys, these youngsters. And, um, you know, I, I, I'd, sometimes they'd take me up the mountainside with them. And it was rugged. I mean, I'd faint when I got up to these high altitudes and... Um, there's no path and it's very icy. But these youngsters, there, there was just no end to what they would devise. They had worked out a way for the widows to make heavy blankets. And you know, they but got sorry, but the how did they get organized? How, how did, did they come from any ideological background? Do they belong to any religion organization? Or how, how did they get well, the I have to tell you something, David. They are so much at risk now because of Taliban repression that they asked us not even to say their name okay. publicly, which is no, a no, shame. No, We've taken that, everything yeah. off of the internet that they ever posted. They had hundreds of videos and photos, and they became increasingly better organized. I mean, they were 12 and 13 years old when I first met this group. Um, they had a very fine mentor. Uh, a Singaporean MD who had moved to first Pakistan and then Afghanistan. And I, they did get a lot of support from Westerners whom they welcomed to come and, you know, stay with them, write about them, get to know them. And um, 
you know, they just had very innovative projects. They planted thousands of trees. They learned permaculture. They were teaching permaculture to people at the university in Kabul. They um, worked out a street kids school. It was so wise. Um, they would give rations to the families of, you know, beans and cooking oil and rice. If the families would agree to send the children first for tutoring to their center, and then they could get the kids into government schools. And, you know, that means a great deal for street children because, you know, street kids may be kind of cute selling tissue paper on the street, but as they grow older, they become the prime victims of human trafficking. So, I mean, I think they were saving lives all the time. But um, a reality of war is that sometimes the most nonviolent thing you can do is to run to flee. And that's the situation they're in right now. They're, they're at grave risk if they remain in Kabul. They did associate with Westerners. None of them can get visas to the United States because they were volunteers. We didn't pay them. And so, you know, um, we jeopardized them in some ways, not, intent not, not intentionally. So, so far, the good news is that 25 are now thriving in Portugal. The Portuguese uh, government gave visas for eight people to go to a depopulated area of Portugal, uh, a, a small town, really, village almost, called Mercola. And these youngsters do have skills in permaculture, so the land is very arid, it's desertified, and now it's pretty lush with crops. They did a great job throughout the last year. And now they'll have residency in Portugal. And pretty. And they, I mean, I think within three months of arrival, they had access to the Portuguese healthcare system. The infant could get childcare. And now 17 have gone to a smaller city in Portugal called Leria. And uh, that project is is moving along quite well. They've been welcomed. And it's a very holistic kind of project. Um, I find people engaged in permaculture have very good common sense and a lot of mapping skills and a sense of design. And that's what should happen. I mean, with the climate crisis, ecological collapse, and wars that we're facing, there will be many more refugees. And we need to learn how to put together uh, humane, mutually beneficial, worthwhile um, programs for refugee resettlement. So the other place that we're very excited about is in Galicia, in northern Spain. Uh, some monks in the Sobrado Monastery have uh, taken one, some families in, and we are now, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a bit of a choreography, to be honest, but there's quite a lot of discussion going on now about getting visas for, we hope, as many as we can cover the financial picture is challenging, but for as many as we can cover, we, we believe we can get visas for young people to go to northern Spain and, again, work on the land, eventually master Spanish, go to universities, and um, especially in depopulated areas, be of good service to people that we hope will welcome them. So this is this is the current situation. Um, are you expecting then uh, you can help more um, more women, or uh, mm -hmm. uh, what, what is your uh, next step? Well, we have had to have we call them guidelines, or you might say variables, because we can't help everybody. If we try to help everybody, we won't help anybody. So our number one priority has been to give preference to women. And um, right now we have a safe space in Islamabad. It's very, very expensive to get from Afghanistan to Pakistan. The visas are now costing $1,400 just, oh, just wow. to get the visa. It, it's cruel. That's crazy. And, um, and then once they get there, um, you know, they, they aren't allowed to work. They're still in a precarious situation. So we have given preference to young women. And then also we ask that people did have experience with this group that I can't name anymore. And that um, they have a passport. And it helps if, well, what we've developed, we call it the buddy system. Um, we try to pair up each young person with somebody 
who's in a more secure situation in Australia or the UK or the United States or Mexico or Canada. And it really works quite well. The buddies get together twice a month on a Zoom call and we talk about the problems our buddies are experiencing and we talk about fundraising. We've managed to distribute quite widely uh, just this week a um, first aid booklet in Dari, which is the language our young friends speak, but we'd love to see it translated into other languages. And then also previously uh, an emergency gardens booklet. And that's the reality people are facing without food. They, they might at least be able to you know, plant some uh, vegetables. How big is the booklet? Uh, the first aid booklet is about seven pages and the, um, the booklet for emergency gardens is about seven pages as well with illustrations. Can we, can we do it at Presenza? We, have, we do eight languages. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Of course, I'll send them to you. That's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very good. Yeah, that will be interesting. Yeah. yeah. If we can help this way, that would be um, for us. It's yeah, um, very practical. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so can you describe a little bit what happened last year in Afghanistan with all the reforms and, and the school and if you have any, um, any, any information? Well, I think when um, the United States was waging war for 20 years against Afghanistan, there were many people who um, were no longer supportive of the Afghan government And there was so much corruption. I mean, just incredible levels and layers of corruption within the society that um, it, it made it easier for the Taliban to, to take over, particularly in the provincial areas where, um, to be honest, some of the Taliban code had been enforced you know, for centuries and, and it wasn't a big stretch for women not to be allowed to have much independence or freedom. They were very much in roles of servitude. In, but in Kabul, that was not the case. Women had made gains, significant, important gains. And any society has to aim for the liberation and, of their women and the full employment and education of women if they're going to be able to make uh, gains across the board in terms of infant mortality, in terms of healthcare in terms of um, being able to provide food for families. So um, the Taliban have been extremely repressive. They don't let women go to the universities. They're now not allowing women to work. Even in UNAMA, the United Nations Agency in Afghanistan, the uh, hospitals have been told you have to cut your women's staff. Uh, it, it's a very, very Uh, cruel and foolish situation. But the United States government has been cruel and foolish, in my opinion, as well. Freezing Afghanistan's assets in the Bank of Afghanistan uh, it has not made a, a positive difference in the lives of women and children. They're the ones who are mainly being punished by that measure. And so um, I think women and girls will be very resilient we find um, them trying to work out education through online education programs, trying to work out ways to get online access. Um, I, I know of several families that are bringing the girls in very quietly and giving them education uh, free of charge. So, so I think we can anticipate that people will do their best, but People have been dying of hypothermia this past harsh winter. Uh, every day, my inbox is bulging with letters from young people saying, we're running out of food. Can you help? So the generosity of the world towards so many refugee situations is certainly necessary. Um, you know, Actually, there was more coverage of Afghanistan in the 20 hours or 20 days, I'm sorry, when the United States troops were leaving than there had been for the past 20 years. And I think a deplorable and degenerate tendency of the United States military is to cause a great deal of wreckage, bloodshed, destruction, and then not only walk away, but immediately turn toward the next war. 
And that's what's happening right now in the United States, um, support for war in Ukraine, but also usage of the war in Ukraine as kind of a proxy rehearsal for possible war with China. And, you know, we can't defend ourselves from the real threats we face, ecological collapse and pandemics and nuclear proliferation by turning to militaries. We've got to find other solutions. And that's where I find the refugee populations are so inspiring. Salman Rushdie said that refugees are the shining shards. No, those who are displaced by war are the shining shards that reflect the truth. I think that's so true. No, no, absolutely. That it, it was a case in, in Colombia uh, where they had uh, a million people who have been displaced, who has been had to move, and then the situation changed, and then uh, you know a peace process has been engaged, and 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 the situation is getting better. But um, but we are not here yet in most of other places like Afghanistan, where there's still very complicated situation. You know, these um, youngsters had conversations with peace activists in Colombia at Apartado Dos, um, and they, they, they had a, every month a conversation with different peace groups all over the world. They were quite well connected and very, very savvy on the different kinds of experiments going on. I like to call it the further invention of nonviolence. Yeah, yeah. No, no, the, the peace process was, at my point of view, was one of the most interesting event happened in, 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 the, in this decade because they really learned from all the other peace process from South Africa, from Ireland, from, mm -hmm. from all the places, try to put it together, uh, engage a local community into the process. I mean, it was really uh, very interesting. Uh, we have a few minutes to, to close. Any, any last uh, call you want to make? Well, I'm very happy to be right now the board president of World Beyond War. And World Beyond War wants to abolish war everywhere. So I would love to encourage all of your listeners and viewers to go to the World Beyond War website and notice the map at that website of all the bases around the world that the United States maintains. And we want to improve that map and also include the bases of other countries. And it, it's a way to show ourselves where we put our resources. And um, I, I don't like to cherry pick, you know, this war is wrong and this one is okay. I think we have to abolish all war. And I'm also part of the Merchants of Death War Crimes Tribunal in November of 2023. We want to hold accountable the corporations that profit. They don't want to see an end to war. They, they make money from wars. How else are they going to market their main products, which are hideous, horrific weapons? So we're going to put Boeing and Raytheon and General uh, Atomics, which manufactures drones, and Lockheed Martin on trial. It's a people's tribunal, and most of the jurors on the tribunal will be people who have survived in war zones, um, but lost loved ones many have been displaced and so we're, we're gathering the evidence and we could use some more volunteers quite honestly because it's a boatload of research uh, to be done so if anyone wants to be in touch about that they could get in touch with me um, kathy.vcnv at gmail.com thank you so much uh, kathy and uh, just for you to know we publish every day an article from david sonson or world without war so wonderful we are very connected Thank you so much. Well, so that I'm was grateful. your show. Sorry? Yeah. I'm grateful. Thank you. That was your show face to face and keep watching your news on presence.com. And we hope to see you and hear from you very soon. Thank you.